Hello everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Coming at you live from Winnipeg here as part of the Long and McQuaid online series. I'm Sam Ray Guitarist and today I am talking about social media for musicians. So the way that this is going to work is that uh, we're going to give, you know, maybe five minutes for people to show up and while I do that I'm going to say hi to you guys in the chat uh, and then I got some talking points I'm going to go through. Um, based on doing stuff live on the internet and then after every one of those talking points We'll take a couple minutes see if you guys have any questions and then we'll move on and then when we've got all the way through that uh, We'll take some time and do a little Q&A at the end of this where we can talk about anything Social media related or not. So hello to everyone Preston Smith. Hello, Matthew Martin guitar. Hello, Cameron Bird Evan sales a lot of people here um very nice to see you guys. I haven't done a live show like this for quite some time, so this is very exciting. And a big thank you to Long McQuaid for putting this together. Uh, fun little fact about Long McQuaid. I used to work there for five years? Four years? It definitely was a, a fun four years. That was at the uh, Long McQuaid in Winnipeg back when it was on Stafford Street. All right, um, I'll just quickly take a look at these comments, and then we are going to... Uh, I guess just dive, dive right into the show. People are coming. Where are you guys all coming from today? I'm in Winnipeg here. Uh, I see some people saying hello from BC. Bob Doucette Music, hello. Leo Nickel, hello. And hello to everyone else who's here. All right, so I guess we can just dive into it. Um, the first thing that I'm going to talk about today, because I think this one will... Um, inform a lot of like how I got to where I am is just my story, how I started doing YouTube, how I ended up in front of you guys today. And I think you'll see a lot of the things that I end up talking about later on in this little session um, directly tie in to my experiences. So age 13, picked up the guitar. I saw Blink-182 playing all the small things on the MTV Music Awards. And that moment, I was like, I got it. This is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Uh, I knew right then and there, 13 years old, that I was going to be a guitar player in some sense. And then from then forward, my goal in life was just to figure out how I could play guitar as my job from then on. So let's fast forward a couple years to, uh, I don't know, like 22-ish. And I decided after just kind of, you know, playing around in Winnipeg with some bands, doing a little bit of traveling, that I my best path for becoming a professional musician was to go to school for music. And so I applied out there. I went to a school called Humber in uh, Toronto. It's uh, 3199 Lakeshore Boulevard West. I started out there and very quickly on, uh, very early on when I got there, it was like my first day of orientation, I met this other guy who is important to this, this story. His name was and is Joel. And right away, we just kicked it off. And one of the things that was unique about our, our situation, I think, was that we were both, from the very beginning, we were interested in the business side of this. Like, uh, that's one of the things that we bonded on pretty early on. We both hadn't come right out of high school. We were starting our degree after taking a couple years off. And so <clears throat> I think when that's the case, um, the way that you kind of go about school is a little bit different. Um, so anyway, him and I hit it off, became very good friends. Uh, one of the best friends that I made out in Toronto. We started playing in bands together. And then around my third year out there, he was working with this band and they were starting to do a lot of social media stuff, a lot of stuff on YouTube. Um, the band is called Walk Off The Earth. And so he had joined this band and he was messaging me. He's like, wow, our, our last video got 50,000 views. Uh, it's being seen in Israel, Brazil, all around the world. And because of this, all these opportunities are arising from the band. Um, so, you know, he's playing in this band. They're starting to see some, some traction. And then in February 2009, I actually don't remember the exact year, 2010, somewhere in there, one of their videos, I got a text from Joel <clears throat> and he said, hey man, um, we're on the front page of Reddit. And I was like, what, what do you mean? Like you posted something that's on the front page. And he was like, no, my band is on the front page of Reddit. So I went to Reddit and there it was, uh, five people playing one guitar. And so this video, 
just got more and more traction. I believe at this point it has 200 million views, which is insane, insanely huge. This was the biggest thing that I've ever seen directly happen. Like this was happening to a friend of mine. Uh, this friend of mine was very much my peer. We were talking about how all these big dreams we had for making it in the music industry. And suddenly it was happening right in front of my eyes to him. He was getting calls. The band was getting calls to go on Ellen. And then they were uh, in the Columbia offices. And then they were going and visiting the guys from Sony. And they were meeting up with the, the highest people in the music industry. Um, they were playing shows at the Mercury Round Lounge in, in New York. A month ago, they were playing empty shows at the YMC in Toronto, and now they are booked a show on Ellen. So I watched this band blow up, and it was incredibly cool to watch this happen to a friend of mine, um, my closest peer, but also, um, and this is something that, you know, I'm not proud of, but there was like a very much a sense of just like, ugly jealousy of this situation. Um, the, what I projected into the world and, and what I uh, would share with him was nothing but positivity and reinforcement. Um, but deep inside, it's like, I want this for myself so, so bad. And here it is happening to my, my closest friend, the guy who I had played in lots of bands with. We thought that our success very well, there's a good chance it would be tied together. But here he is going and doing these things, whereas I'm thinking about my next whatever assignment for school. Like I was still very much at the bottom. So this is an important part in this story because I saw the power of social media and what it could do for a band. And that just like put this seed in my head. Until this point, everyone who had succeeded in the music industry uh, Gary Taylor asked what the band name was again and the band is called Walk Off the Earth. So everything I'd seen in this industry was just so distant for me. It seemed like anyone who succeeded was, had ungodly talent, had these crazy breaks or whatever. Um, but these guys were like, I knew these guys. I could play music with these guys. I had played music with these guys. And I was seeing them blow up, become a massively huge worldwide band. So that just put it into my mind, the power of YouTube. And it convinced me well, it didn't convince me, but I just put it in my mind that this was something that was, that had, that could take, that could essentially allow you to cut in line. So they weren't paying your dues playing like the clubs and doing all these things that you used to do. You could get a viral video on YouTube and something could happen with it. So the next part of the story is I was watching uh, the news um, casts talking about Walk Off the Earth. And I remember a very specific newscast, uh, the lady was like, that was really cool watching five people play one guitar. But what I would really like to see is one person play five guitars. Um, and I just thought to myself, that's, I mean, there's got to be a way of doing that. So I went to Best Buy and I bought the cheapest camera there. It is a, it was like the entry level DSLR camera. We'll talk about gear later. Um, but uh, I bought that camera and I just figured out a way to make, to play five guitars. Like I lay them out in front of me on my bed, put the camera over there and like treated it like a harp. And I would just practice it and practice it. This arrangement I made for Elise and eventually I, I shot it and I just put that video on a hard drive and it just sat there for, for years. Cause I didn't have um, a YouTube channel at that point. I didn't know what to do with it, but it was just, I guess when I look back at it, I can see myself trying to replicate the success um, that Walk Off the Earth had. I mean, replicated in almost like an identical way, but just switch it around a little bit. And so I graduated school and I was like, okay, um, I got to figure out how I'm going to have a job in this industry. And in my last year of school, I was kind of finding myself gravitating towards songwriting. And I thought that I was had a decent knack for writing mainstream country music. So I was really kind of starting to look at that sort of stuff. Um, after I graduated, I started going down to Nashville and doing some writing down there. But I really didn't want to just be a staff writer. I wanted to have like a project that was my own. And so a friend of mine in Winnipeg, he messaged me and he's like, hey, I got this idea for uh, a mainstream band. Um, if you move back to Winnipeg, we can start it and start working on this together. So I moved back, packed everything up. Um, because also at this point, I was just like hemorrhaging money. It's expensive to live in Toronto. And I was gigging. I was doing some stuff like that. But it was just like, 
like maybe just scratching by, but also having to dip into savings. So I was like, okay, I'll move back to Winnipeg, move back in with my parents and me and my friend, we started a band. And the plan with the band was that we were going to record some music Sorry, I'm just bringing my computer back up here so I can see my talking points. We were gonna record music and the way that we were going to develop a fan base was we were going to use the walk off the earth approach. I had all these ideas for crazy viral music videos or potentially viral music videos. And what we wanted to do with the band was just make these videos, like not even worry about playing shows or anything like that. We would just make these videos, put them on YouTube. And I thought that eventually one of them would blow up and get us cut ahead, like let us cut ahead in the line. So we weren't just like starting from the bottom, working up. Um, one of the things I quickly found out with this band, and I worked on this for one to two years, was that it's very hard to ask um, people to buy into your vision when there's like no money involved, no fan base involved. It was right at the ground floor. And I was just like, guys, we gotta put this effort into this because even if it doesn't make money for a bit, just trust me, something's gonna happen with one of these ideas. It's going to, it's gonna hopefully blow up. Um, and I just found like it was, it was too much to ask out of people who had full-time jobs or had families. Whereas me, like I had nothing going on at that point. I was living with my parents, uh, no girlfriend, no money, no job besides like just like a couple gigs here and there and teaching some guitar lessons. But I essentially had all the time in the world to, to put into this. Nobody else could put that into the project. Um, and so I just kind of got frustrated and I was like, you know what, I'm gonna just start posting things on Instagram. And so I started posting some of these ideas on Instagram, things like uh, a clip from that video that I took years back of me playing five guitars. Um, I posted stuff like things that would eventually become things on my YouTube channel. And then I started to see like for the first time in my life that people were watching my content that was on Instagram, people who I never had ever met in my life. And I would see that my numbers of followers were going up. Like I hit a thousand followers on Instagram and it was like, wow, that is crazy. I'm getting 30, 40 likes here. This is more than any of my friends. This is awesome. Um, and so after posting on just on Instagram for a couple months, I would keep getting the comment. And the, by the way, this was back when Instagram was 15 seconds. I keep getting the comment, where can I see the YouTube video? Where can I see the YouTube video for that? So the next thing to do was start a YouTube channel, take some of these old ideas, stretch them into full videos, and I started releasing them on YouTube. And the third or fourth one that I put out uh, was me playing uh, Don't Fear the Reaper on only using iPad apps. And that one ended up getting shared on Reddit, got like 200,000 views. And having like seen, like at this point, this was the most successful thing that I'd ever been a part of. And I think I had like, I don't know, 3000 subscribers at this part, but I got 200,000 views, which was unimaginable. And from then on, I'm like, I'm just, I'm doing this. Um, I think I was, I don't know, 26, 27, 28 years old. I was like, this is probably the last real concerted effort I put into uh, creating a career path in the music industry. If this doesn't work out, then I'm probably gonna go and become like a lawyer or something like that. Maybe I would have uh, sent my resume back to Long McQuaid scene if they would have wanted to rehire me. So I started putting everything I could into this. Um, and I think it was two years of me just like putting my heart and soul into video after video after video, um, putting full-time hours into this, getting paid essentially zero dollars. Like every now and then I get a check from YouTube <clears throat> for like a hundred bucks. But I was making very little money doing that. Um, I was using some of my YouTube to start uh, a Fiverr business, which I can talk about later too. Uh, anyways, so two years just putting full-time hours into it, not making any money. And then the, just the algorithm turned in my favor and uh, I had a video for whatever reason just started getting recommended a lot and I was like okay now we're now we're rolling and uh, I think that was like year three of doing YouTube was the first time like in my life that I made a respectable income and actually had to like pay some taxes <laughs> and then from then on it was just like just keeping on with that same approach videos um, trying to always 
change with it, try to keep on evolving and building this, this business. And then fast forward five years and here I am now. So that would be the, the short version of my story. If anybody has any questions about that or comments on that, uh, you can let me know in the chat. Otherwise we can kind of move on to the next point. And the chat is a little bit delayed. So um, I will keep an eye over there. And probably right about now I should see, ah, there we go. People are now starting to ask about it. So uh, Jaron Jammer says, I appreciate your videos and the years you put into this. Thank you. Well, thank you for watching and thank you guys um, for being a part of it. I mean, one of the things I tell people every now and then, and this is something that I truly believe in, is this doesn't happen without people watching it, people watching me. So my success is very much based on people checking out my videos, watching on a regular basis. So thank you to uh, people like you who tune into stuff like this. Okay, uh, why don't we move on here to the, the next point that I have here. So one of the things that, uh, oh, Emery Cords asks, how did you get 750,000 subscriptions? One at a time, my friend. It was, um, a, it's been a very long and slow process. Like I've been doing this for six years. I remember all the milestones. I remember hitting 3,000, getting another 1,000, hitting 4,000. It took me like two years to hit 30,000. And then from then on, it's just every now and then the algorithm throws you a bone and just recommends your channel and it grows. And it, I think we can get into maybe the, the details of growing later, but for me, it's just been persistence. When there's dips, I just keep on working through it. When it's going well, that's great, but just keeping on doing it, trying to make the best content you can, that's what has worked for me. Uh, Finn Seegers asks, were you big in the Saskatchewan, Manitoba music scene? When I was like 18, 19, 20, uh, we played the bars around Winnipeg. Uh, what defines being big? I'm not really sure. Like we would get like 30 of our friends out to shows which was a lot compared to other people. Um, I wouldn't say like I was like our band was known, but it was more of a learning experience. Um, okay, let's do one more and then we'll move on. And you guys, if you feel free to bring up these questions again, because people are quite starting to ask quite a bit. So uh, if I don't get to you right away, we will come back to um, more questions as we go on. Uh, so Shiloh D asks, quality or quantity? I've recommended to just post out as opposed to obsessing over perfection. This gets into what your voice is as a content creator. Um, some of the best content I've seen has been just like off the cuff, easy stuff to do. But also then you have people who are making high end, perfect videos. It's about finding the balance and what works for your audience. I would say I don't think it's a, an easy answer but you gotta figure out what works for you. You don't want to never make videos and put tons and tons of time into making one video and then you finally put it out, but you've never put anything else out. So it's not like there's other people, there's not like you've engaged an audience already, um, but you also don't wanna be just like shooting everything and putting everything out because then I think it cheapens what you do. So it's a balance there. Okay, so we're gonna move on to the next talking point. Uh, and uh, that is what do you need to get started with tech stuff? One of the most beautiful and wonderful things is that you can start with just your phone. And what I'll do with this topic is I'll talk about the things that I kind of bought along the way and the impact that they had. Um, but really my relationship with gear is you can make incredible content with as long as you can record yourself. The most valuable piece of gear you have is the ideas that are in your head. Um, everything else should just be a way to, uh, a means to express what you hear in your head, but if like, or what you wanna create. But if you have, like if you have a terrible idea and you have the best gear in the world, it's still gonna be a garbage video. If you have an amazing idea and just a cell phone, it can still be a great video. So let's talk about some of the stuff that I used along the way. I don't wanna spend a ton of time on the tech stuff because I don't know that it's the most interesting for some people, but we'll kind of power through it here. 
Uh, like I said, the first camera that I bought was a Canon Rebel T3i, and I bought just like some uh, some industrial lights. So, th like I, I can't remember how much they were. They weren't very much. It was the base level of things, and that's all I used for a year or two to make my videos. Um, I was recording the audio with my camera, micro or with my phone microphone, and then I was just like putting it together in an editing program. Uh, eventually, I moved over to some of the recording software I had to get my audio because I thought that that sounded sounded much better. So I used that for a long period of time, and I think that was. I mean, you can see if you go back and watch my videos, like you can see the quality change. Uh, the the editing software I use is a program called Final Cut Pro, um, and I remember specifically learning how to work that program using some YouTube tutorials. And uh, I don't have any training in in video editing, but I would just like the more I did it, every time I would figure out a little something. So the the biggest piece of the biggest thing that I think initially changed what my videos look like, and you can pinpoint the moment when I found this, was lighting. Uh, lighting is more valuable than probably anything else. Like right now, if I just turned on the lights in this room, it would look not nearly as nice as it looks right now. Like I've got the light in the back over there, lights over there. I've got two lights there, one in the back. Um, so I bought some lights two years into it, and you can notice exactly when it changes. There's a specific video, and then everything from then on just looks better because you have more control over it. Um, and once you figure out how to kind of use some lighting tricks, it just makes it pop a little bit. So from then on, like I just used that setup for another numerous years till like, I guess last year. Uh, and I bought a 4K camera, a Canon EOS R. And what that allows you to do now is it allows you to capture video that's bigger than the video that you're gonna be sharing on YouTube. So you can like zoom in and get multiple, you can kind of fake it so it looks like there's multiple cameras on you. Sometimes it's zoomed in closer, sometimes it's farther away, but you only have to do it with one shot. So that was also, that was the next big game changer was shooting in 4K. Um, and then besides that, like for audio, I'm using a PreSonus, Fire Studio, which is like, I think it's like $200 you can buy these for now. They're, it's an old thing, it's not fancy. But people are watching my videos through like their phones and their laptop speakers. You don't need to have the best, highest quality of audio gear to get something that sounds like something that's an acceptable level. And then I have a shotgun mic up here, which is Sennheiser, I don't know, something or other that works pretty good. Okay, so that's what I use for uh, my video stuff. I don't think you need, I mean, I've upgraded it quite a bit in, over the years and now I'll sometimes use two cameras, but really you can start from like the base level, anything. Like I have friends who have made, who have careers doing YouTube and they shoot everything on their phone. So that's what you need. You need a phone, you need a good idea. The better the idea, better and then just like slowly grow with time and slowly try to tweak little aspects of it. Anyone got any questions about gear? Let's see what you guys are saying. Uh, Steven Vachon says YouTube doesn't, doesn't YouTube have 4K? Yes, YouTube does have 4K, but I never upload in 4K here because I like, I think it's more valuable to be able to release it in 1080 and have those angle changes um, versus doing it in 4K. So if I wanted to release on 4K, then I would need to like start shooting in 8K and then zooming in that way. And that would just be way too much. Uh, Joe Kulmoni asks, uh, my video editor, my video editing software is Final Cut. Uh, Dennis Dion says, is the sound coming through this mic right now? Yes, it is the microphone. Here you can see it up there. That's the microphone that I'm using. Um, okay. Is an entry level guitar through a Boss Katana good enough quality for socials? I get worried that I won't get a positive reaction because of my gear. Honestly, if you're playing amazing, then it doesn't matter what you use. And let me tell you a quick little story um, before I move on here regarding guitar gear because that's, that's a whole other can of worms. I have so much guitar gear that I've just accumulated through the years. 
I started with just um, my Telecaster and an acoustic, so you don't need all this stuff that I have, but my collection has now grown to like 40 some guitars, a lot of amps, a lot of pedals of the weird variety. Anyway, um, okay, so one of the things, my biggest lessons of gear was when I was working back at Long McQuaid, uh, this is when the store was on Stafford in Winnipeg, and there was one guitar player who had been working at the store for years. His name's Phil. Shout out to Phil. And I remember Phil went into one of the practice rooms with a Squire Stratocaster and the Squire amp that comes in the Strat Pack. And I remember he was like playing it for to demo for someone, and he sounded like Jeff Beck. It was amazing. And I was like, you know what? If Phil can make that the most basic gear sound good, then it's more about what you play than it is about the stuff you own. All the gear, like I said, all the guitar gear, and I feel the same way about guitar gear as I do video gear, it is all just to streamline the sounds that you can create. Um, so if I'm playing through a $150 amp, I would still think it's gonna sound pretty good. It'll sound better if I'm playing through like a $3,000 amp, but it's just, what, what my point is, is that it's not the piece of gear, it's the notes you play. Okay, uh, let's move on to my next talking point. Oh, Mark London. Shout out, Mark. He's a, uh, a colleague, or a former colleague of mine from the Long McQuaid days. Uh, okay, so uh, next thing we're gonna talk about is how to come up with engaging content. A great question, and that is something that uh, if you want to do this and you want to put things out, that's going to be the thing that that's going to be the hardest thing. The thing that I battle with on a weekly basis, it is the absolute hardest thing to do is come up with engaging content. So, one of the things that I do is like having done this for so long, my brain I just kind of train my brain to wear what I call. Um, wear what I call my YouTube glasses. And so I walk around the world with my YouTube glasses on. These aren't, I don't actually wear these. But I walk around the world with my YouTube glasses on and I'm just always looking for ideas passively. It's like there's a radar that goes around in my head that's ready to receive any ideas that might turn into a video. There, and having done this so long, it's just like I'm, train myself just to not always be like actively like looking around for it, but just to be like, if an idea comes through, that thing grabs it and tells me, oh, hang on, maybe think a little bit more about this. How do you get those ideas? I don't know, you just like live your life. Like you go on to, sometimes I go onto the YouTube home feed and just see what other people are doing and see if I can maybe put a guitarist spin on it. Um, sometimes someone will just say something to me and I'll be like, oh, that could be a cool idea. Sometimes things will happen in my life. And I think to myself, oh, that could be a cool idea. For example, um, back a couple months ago when we first moved into the new house, I noticed right away that there was a clicking sound in my guitar amps. And I thought to myself, I think most people would just be like, I gotta fix this problem. But having done what I've done for so long, my first thing was like, okay, this is super annoying, but how can I turn this into a video? And just always be looking for those types of things and be ready to just try it and go for it and see where it goes. Um, one of the things I've found is that a lot of my best videos, which have performed the best in the long run, have been ideas where I've said to myself, at some point along the line, this is stupid, I shouldn't be doing this, what am I doing? So just doing it and just putting it out there is always a pretty good uh, thing to do. As far as other way means of creating content, so one of the things, when I was first doing YouTube, every video, I was trying to make every video a video that could go viral. Okay, so everyone, and if you look at my first two years, like every video is some crazy idea that in my mind could potentially have been viral. I could do like one or two videos a month they didn't come out that often because there was such, such a huge workload that went into them, whether that be practicing the part, putting it together, or just like coming up with the idea. I realized very quickly that that was not a sustainable thing to do. Like I couldn't be putting out one of those big crazy videos 
every week f for a year to turn this into like a long-term career. So what I started thinking about was, okay, well, what can I do to supplement some of these things? What can I do that doesn't take nearly as much time and also engages people? And that's when I started the Sensei series, which was an instructional series that I could get done. Like I could do one of those in five days, maybe less, three days, and then spend the rest of my time doing bigger ideas. And then I would also start, and that was also like the first, that series was the first time I started talking to the camera a lot. And then I, when I opened that can of worms of just talking to the camera, I was like, well, there's actually a lot of other things that I can do. And I started just trying new things, seeing what clicked. Um, that's a big thing is just trying things, just going into different places, trying this. Oh, that didn't work. That's fine. Um, it's not like, it's not like there's a record label who's going to cut me. If it didn't work on YouTube, maybe the next thing will. So one of the things I found was these series that I could turn into long-term things, like the Sensi series, for example. I think I've done like 60 instructional videos. Um, and then I came up with this other series called the Hufo series, which is like honest, unfiltered opinions. And that's something that doesn't require that huge creative effort to come up with an idea that's brand new. Instead, I can turn this one idea, doing honest, unfiltered opinions, on things that people ask me about, I can turn that one idea into tens and tens of ideas or tens and tens of videos. Um, other things like a series doing weird guitars. I can do lots of videos with that premise. So one of the things that I think is important is when you do get videos that do well, take that idea and see if you can stretch it out so that you're not requiring brand new creative effort every week, week in, week out. If you have to come up with a brand new idea every week, it's very, very difficult to do. So that's a big part of what, of what I do now is like keeping it so that I don't have to dig into my brain and try to find out with something brand new because I made 400 some videos at this point. Um, I would never have been able to come up with 400 completely fresh ideas. So those are some thoughts on engaging content. One of the things that some people recommend is watch the trends and that would be like, you're paying attention to what's hot in the world, uh, whatever that may be, a dance move, a song, some other viral thing where a guy's skateboarding, drinking cranberry juice, whatever it is, and um, try to create content based on that sort of stuff. I've never had any success chasing the trends for the most part because I've just found by the time I was able to, by the time I was making a video for a trend, like I was already behind the eight ball. And if something's trendy, everybody is trying to do this. So I just found it too stressful to try to like get things out fast. And I thought probably the quality would suffer. And so if you're on a platform like TikTok where you can just do something really quick, then it's maybe worthwhile chasing some trends. But on YouTube, if you're trying to make some bigger content that takes more of a, a um, effort, then you're probably just gonna end up behind the eight ball and it's just discouraging there. So I don't love chasing the trends for, for the most part. I would rather try to do things that potentially set a new trend. Though I don't know that I ever have. Uh, does anyone have any questions about engaging content, coming up with engaging content? Let's see what you guys are saying. Um, the Space Time Unwind says, would you suggest posting content as you create it or buffering, stretching it out over time, one of the, I, I think it's good to kind of, what I'm getting out of this is you're asking whether you should like post a ton of videos right away as you create them or like plan it out so you're maybe if you made five videos in one week instead of releasing five videos in a week, you release it over the course of uh, five weeks. If you can do daily videos that really benefits the YouTube algorithm or so it seems, but I don't know if that's, that's never been sustainable to me to do things that fast. Um, I like doing things and spacing them out if I can, just so I feel like I can breathe a little bit. And I think if people always know, hey, Monday, one o'clock central time, there's a new video, it's more likely that people will just kind of know to tune in at that time every week versus like surprising them with a video here and there. But that's something that, that's what's worked for me. Um, I think with a lot of this stuff, and this is kind of a bigger idea, is that 
I can tell you what's worked for me, but what, what has worked for me probably won't work exactly for you. It's more important to take some of the bigger concepts, concepts that I'm talking about and incorporate them versus trying to do all these specific things. Because first of all, just what I do is unique to me. What you do is unique to you. If you try to use the same approach that worked for me, your product might be totally different, right? It'd be like McDonald's marketing strategy. If you try to apply that to, I don't know, a toilet <laughs> marketing strategy, you're, it probably won't work because the products are very different. But you can look at some of the bigger concepts and see if you can start applying them. So that's just a thing to note. Um, and anyone who says, uh, do this, do this, do this, that's just, I wouldn't buy into that because it's always evolving too. I started doing this in 2014, 2010 YouTube or 2020 YouTube, 2021, whatever year it is, has changed. I don't even remember what the original question was. So I hope I, I, hope I answered it. Uh, let's do another one here before we move on. Um, Okay, so Sean McDonald asks, any specific tips on how to play the YouTube algorithm? Okay, great question. And um, that actually is the next point, is how to go viral or at least play into the YouTube algorithm. Okay, this could be probably a full three hour session on itself. So I'm gonna try to keep it fairly brief. The biggest thing that you can do to help you on the YouTube algorithm from what I've seen is to prove to the algorithm that people want to watch your videos. How do you prove to the algorithm that that is the case is that the people who have already subscribed to you, they want to click on that video. So when they get that notification or email or whatever, if they are clicking on that video and watching the video um, and YouTube sees that a lot of these people are engaging, it's more likely to start showing it to other people because you've kind of proven yourself to that initial first round. So I can usually tell within the first 10 minutes how many views a video of mine will get. Sometimes it's, it totally surprises me um, and it seems that there's always some fluctuations, but generally if I, if I see that a ton of people of my audience is watching a video, I can suspect that the algorithm will show it around. So the be best thing you can do is just make good engaging content. It all stems from that. Everything you do on any platform online all stems from making good engaging con content, which is what we just talked about. What that means to you, what that good engaging content is, different for everyone. And that's something you're going to need to spend a lot of time trying to cater and, and, and build. And the more you do it, the more of an instinct you get for that kind of thing. Just doing it, just making lots and lots of videos is one of the best things you can do. It's like, in many ways, it's like songwriting. Like I had a bit of a leg up when I started YouTube just because I had done a lot of videos on Instagram. So I kind of had my chops ready. Like I knew how to work some of this stuff. I'd also done a little bit of work as um, a video editor and filmer for a couple of music projects when I lived in Toronto. Just stuff like my friends would ask me to do. But I, I knew how it worked. So I knew that as soon as I started putting my stuff on YouTube, it wasn't gonna look terrible. Um, and, but the more you do it, the more you just gain a, uh, an instinct for what, for what good content is. Um, but it's like they say with songwriting, or at least this is what I say with songwriting. You got to put your heart and soul into something like 50 songs that are probably going to suck before you start writing the good ones. And then the first good one will come along and you'll be like, wow, that was way better than anything else I ever, I've ever written even though maybe I used to think these other songs were good. In hindsight, they're all pretty bad, but this one was really good. And then you write like 10 really bad ones again. And then you write another good one. And then the good ones start to happen at more of a frequency. And sometimes you write a great one. And sometimes you write a really good one that other people don't like. But the more you do it, the more you hone your craft, and the more you get to that point where you can make things that other people would like. So how to go viral. Um, that's the biggest thing is just making good stuff. Um, that should kind of go without saying. Everything comes from a good idea. If your video sucks, it's probably not gonna go viral, at least for the right reasons. It might go viral because it's terrible, but that's probably not ideal. However, Rebecca Black did turn her career around after releasing that song Friday, and now she's actually quite a respected YouTuber and uh, musician, so. 
So first of all, what you want to do, make good content. And then now the question could be, okay, well, so I've made all this good content. I really think it's good, but that I have zero people who follow me on social media. So what do I do to get over that first initial hurdle? Um, and I, for me, I found like by the time I hit 3000 subscribers and I've heard this before, and I don't know if it's still the case. I've heard a lot of people who at 30,000 was when they started seeing things kind of roll for them. Uh, when Walk Off the Earth got their viral video, it was at around 35,000 subscribers. My friend Rob Scallon, who's also a YouTube creator, he said that he started doing this full time at 30,000 ish, um, or at least that's when he quit his job. I started making a full time income doing this around 30,000 subscribers. So I don't know if this is, I've seen this happen before. I don't know if it's like uh, an exact number or anything, but it seems once you get to that number, then you have enough people that the algorithm can gain enough data from your initial views to decide to, to recommend it. So the question would be, well, how on God's green earth do I get 30,000 subscribers? That's a lot of people. That's like all the people who are, are in the small town of Kenora subscribing to my YouTube channel. How do I do that? For me, what I spent a lot of time doing was figuring out where my potential audience was and figuring out how I could get my videos in front of them. What that means for you could be very different. I knew that I wanted to be a guy on YouTube who made YouTube guitar content. If you were doing like singer songwriter stuff and YouTube is a side thing, then maybe you're going to approach this differently. But my, my goal was how do I get my YouTube videos in front of people? It was just time and effort and trying to come up with different ways of doing it. Um, but it was like a grueling labor intensive thing. So one of the things I used to do on Instagram and at this point in my life, I look back and say, okay, maybe this wasn't the best tactic in the world, but this is what I did. I would literally every single day when I woke up, I'd spend an hour going through everything that said hashtag guitar and just liking it. You know, it's a pretty spammy thing to do. Um, and I don't know if it still works anymore, but I would just like that with the idea that people would see that this guy named Samurai Guitarist liked my post. I'm going to go check out and see what he does. And then they come ideally watch some of my videos and be like, oh, wow, he's actually really cool. I'm going to subscribe to him. So I would do that twice every day for an hour, like before I went to bed. And when I woke up in the morning, I would just physically go and like every single one of those posts to try to get some people interested in what I did. It's not the best tactic but it worked at least at first. Um, you don't want it to be super spammy, but you know, you do what you got to do and that worked for me. But that was also like, wasn't doing a ton. So I figured like, okay, this is gaining, a, this is not sustainable. I'm not going to spend the rest of my life liking hashtag guitar content. So now that I've got this YouTube page, how can I get some of this content that I'm creating in front of other people? So Posting, like I used to post myself on Reddit um, and that's kind of frowned upon on certain places like r slash videos, but I would post my own videos there and just like cross my fingers and hope that they did well because nobody else was posting them. So I figured, why don't I just do this myself? Uh, and then I also started looking for other subreddits and places on that website that I could find my audience. And so I started doing self posts on r slash guitar, which is a community of guitar players. And I would just write out basically all the information I would share in my sensei series, explaining all the points that I was talking about, essentially offering like some free content by just like, you just open up the post and read the text. And then at the end I would say, and if you want to see a video on this, just click on this link. So I did that for quite a bit, uh, labor intensive that gained, I don't know, a couple thousand subscribers. And then I would do that for other subreddits. I would, uh, go, okay. So here's another thing I did. Um, I found every single blog that I could that shared content. Like I, that, like I was creating, there were blogs, like I'm trying to remember some of them. Laughing squid was one of them. Um, just, there's a lot of blogs that share content. And so what I did was email them every single time I put out a new video that I thought might work on their websites. I would just send them an email like, Hey man, put out this video where I did this crazy thing. Uh, if you guys want to share it, that'd be awesome. If you don't want to, that's cool too. And I would just every single like Monday or whatever it was when I put out a video, I would just send out tons and tons of emails like that. Uh, and here's also a theory behind this that's worth noting. I would try to create maybe like a personal relationship with the people as much as I could. Like I wouldn't just copy and paste the same email every single time. 
I remember like Laughing Squid used to share my videos all the time. And so I found the specific person who was writing those blog posts and I would email them to, to him and just be like, hey man, thanks for what you said about my last video. It's fun to make. Here's another one that I did, check it out. Things like that, things that make it a little bit more personal. Uh, Sean McDonald says like virtual cold calling. Yeah, like virtual cold calling. That's exactly what it was. But I thought that I had a product that would be not purchasable, but that would um, be interesting to some people. So it wasn't like I was emailing these people with these really bad videos and me doing something that wasn't interesting at all. I always thought like, I wanted to respect this person's time. They are looking for content. So if I'm emailing them with a video, I want to make sure that it's a good one so that they know whenever they see a samurai guitarist pop up in their inbox, it's worth looking at. From there, like that approach, I did that for two or three years and that's what it took me to get to that point where the YouTube algorithm just for whatever reason said, hey, we like this guy. And then from 30,000, like over the course, of like two or three months, my channel got like 40,000 subscribers. Um, and so that was, I don't know why, still to this day, I don't know why. And every now and then something just clicks with the algorithm and it gets a ton of views. But the biggest thing was getting over that initial hurdle for me. And so that's, that's how I did it. I try not to think too, too much about the algorithm because, so here's the thing, and this is kind of the, uh, we're getting to the world of like, the not so great things about being a social media presence is that you, my boss is very much this mythical YouTube algorithm. And to anyone who's not uh, familiar with this, the algorithm is the thing that it's software that YouTube or Google or Alphabet has made that will recommend my videos and show my videos to just show my videos around the platform, whether that be recommended after a video popping up in that little sidebar there. So it's like working for an invisible boss who you never met, who nobody really knows anything about. And every now and then that boss like gives you a nice big reward. That boss gives you a raise on one of your videos and it just gets tons of views and you have no idea why. And so you're like, okay, well, I want to try to recreate this, but then you try to do that thing again and it doesn't do well. And it's really discouraging because you're like, okay, well, why doesn't my boss like me right now? Is it, is it a problem with what I'm making? Is it the people aren't interested in what I do? What's, what's going on here? And it can be really, really discouraging. And you can be like, you can, you can spend all your time trying to impress this imaginary, it's not imaginary, impress this invisible boss and nothing will happen. And then one time it just, it just works for whatever reason. Trying to think, I try to think about that stuff as little as I can. Um, I'd be lying if I said it wasn't very much on my mind a lot of the time, but I try to just focus on what I can control. I don't control the algorithm. I, nobody knows every single component of how it works. This is one of the things I've found out through talking to like YouTube reps. One person built this part of it. One person built this part of it. Nobody fully understands the whole thing. It just seems like it's this thing that has almost gone on to have a mind of its own. So what can I control? I don't really control what the algorithm does. What I can control is the stuff I make. And my theory from day one has always been, if I make things that I think I would like, there will be other people who like it as well. If I always try to come back to that, do I enjoy making this? Would I enjoy watching this? Yes, then I'm gonna put it out into the world. And whether it does well, whether it doesn't do well, I need to try to detach and you need to try to detach from that as much as you can and then go back, rev up, do the same thing and do it because it's fun. Um, I do this also because like it's my job now, but really when I was first doing all those videos at the beginning, it was really, really fun to do them. I felt like I was, I don't know, I felt like it felt special to me. It was like I was doing things that I'd never had seen done before and it was really, really fun to do that. And that's why I did it. And when things went well with the algorithm, it was like a bonus pat on the back, but I would just try to tell myself not to focus too much on that. Questions on the algorithm. Let's see what you guys are saying. A lot of comments here. I love it. Stuart Drake says, with regards to content creation, how do you stop yourself from chasing numbers? Um, I, I don't, uh, like I won't, that's the thing that I, numbers make up a huge part of my life. I'm always watching how many people have engaged with the video, how many people have subscribed, how far away I am from the next big milestone. 
what I think is important to do is just compartmentalize it, realize you, at least I realize that I can't detach myself completely from that. So I will try to just like put that in a little, in a little jar and I'll access that jar when I need to. If those thoughts start coming through my mind, I will just let them, let them come, see them through, but not dwell on it too much. I don't try to shut them out because if I try to shut them out, they just keep on knocking on, knocking on my mind, wanting to come in. So I let them in, let them do their thing, let them go away. Uh, and the more I do that, the more I'm kind of trying to be at peace with, with, uh, with those numbers for, for better or for worse. Uh, Let's do another question here, and then we will move on to our next topic. Stephen Vachon says, what comes after YouTube? So that's a great question. Um, and I'll interpret that as like, what am I going to do after I'm done YouTube? And it's something that I think about a lot because I certainly will not be doing YouTube at the same pace that I've done it for the next 10, 20 years. And I'm not at the point where I want to retire yet. I think I'll pro it'll probably always be in my life in some way. Um, but if I were to walk away from YouTube or if it were just to like the system or YouTube was just like, yeah, we're retiring, we're done. We're closing down YouTube. Then I think what I would want to be doing for me is be involved in something creative, uh, ideally in the music industry. I would hope that what I've done on YouTube has opened up enough doors so that I could um, find a job that I enjoy in the music industry. Though I'm pretty sure I would have to move. Uh, I don't, if I, I live in Winnipeg right now, middle of Canada, city of like 750,000 people. There are some great musicians who live here, great musicians who, who have come from here, but there's not a lot of work in the industry here. I'm not, I'm not able to do what I would want to do in this city. So I would have to move probably to LA or Nashville, um, maybe Toronto, but having lived in Toronto and having spent a lot of time in both LA and Nashville, you got to live in a music city if you want to have success in the traditional music realm, what I've found. Um, YouTube works when you live wherever, but if you want to, if you want to chase a tiger, don't go to Antarctica. If you want to chase tigers, go to where tigers be. And there's not a lot of musical tigers in Winnipeg. So I would probably move to LA uh, when, if YouTube was done and I would probably uh, just use my contacts, see what I can do. Um, maybe start ideally before that day comes, I've laid enough ground for that door to be, or for that path to be easy to walk down. So that would be my, my answer to that question. Lewis L says, was there a video that you thought would definitely go viral, but failed miserably? Yeah. There's been a number of times where that's happened. Actually. I think the biggest one was uh, a video where I thought this was like, and I still think this is one of my coolest videos. I went into my ba the backyard at my parents' place and every week I sat on the same tree stump. I sat, set my camera up in the exact same spot and every, every week for a year, I played a bar of a song. And so what you saw was at the end, you have the, your full song and I stitched all these passages together and you see um, the seasons change in the back room, background over the course of this video. Uh, before I started shooting it, I cut my hair and shaved. And so you see me grow a huge beard and you see my hair grow long. Uh, I thought that was like, to me, one of the coolest ideas. I call it like a musical time lapse. And um, it just it just didn't get very many views. The only reason why it's got as many views as it, as it has is because I've been asked this question before and I've brought up this video a number of times. But I thought that one was like, I was like, this is the one that's, uh, this is the one that's gonna put me on the map didn't put me on the map and it was a little discouraging. Here's one of the things I've also found is you can't put all this weight on one thing. You got to find ways to do um, video content and social media content for spread it out over the long run. Like if you're kind of putting all your eggs in this one basket and you're sure this was, is going to go viral and then it doesn't, it's extremely discouraging. So you got to find ways to be able to just, do not put everything on this one, one idea. Cause here's the other thing. I have had videos that have done quite well. I think my most viewed one has 4 million views, um, which is actually the one where I went into Long and McQuaid in Winnipeg and just gave guitar pedals out to random people. But had that been my very first video that I ever put out, that would have not blown up into a career. 
what has made this a career is just steadily putting out tons and tons and tons of videos, like 400 at this point. That's what you got to do is find ways to not put everything in one basket because even if it goes well, it's not going to, unless it goes crazy viral, like my friends from Walk Off the Earth, where it gets 200 million views, it's not going to make your career happen overnight. I don't even think that happens anymore. Like I have a theory that that video was one of the last true viral videos. Um, and I'm going to go off on a little bit of a tangent here, but I think one of the things that's happened is that people have grown a, uh, what's the right word for this? A fascination fatigue, a wow factor fatigue. In 2009, 2005, we hadn't spent the last 15 years on YouTube. Like all of us have now been watching YouTube videos and TikTok videos, Instagram videos, mm -hmm. Twitter stuff. We've been doing this for a long time now. So to be blown away by something we see online, uh oh, I just swiped away from something. Whoops. Um, to be blown away with something that we see online takes a lot more to do that to the point where I'm not even, like it's incredibly hard to wow somebody because They've just seen so much. They've become, um, what's that word? They become de desensitized to, to things that wow them. So it's more important to create connections with people and do that over a long period of time. Uh, let's do one more comment here and then we'll move on to the next thing. Uh, let's find one here. Um, Scrolling, see some people commenting on the Jets. Love my Winnipeg Jets. Uh, replay Value asks, when are the shop dogs returning? The shop dogs will be returning soon enough. Don't you worry, we've got some stuff planned. Um, and Shiloh D asks, in a TikTok era, it's so easy to go viral. Okay, so that's a good point. I'm not sure, are we touching on this later? Yes, we are. Right now, TikTok is like one of the, it is one of the last places where things just can truly go viral. Like, I don't know what's going on with their algorithm, but any musician who wants to start doing things on social media needs to go on TikTok because that is the one place where I've seen people with zero followers go from zero to like get a million views overnight. Nowhere else that I know of can you see that as regularly as you can on TikTok. So something's going on with that algorithm that's kind of scary, but also it's very, very powerful if you want to be creating content. Okay, uh, let's move on. Um, so how to build a following and a strong channel. I think we kind of d touched on that. As far as a strong channel goes, like when, I said this before, but you got to think about what works for you and what your audience comes to expect of you. If your audience is like engaged with you and just talking to your camera and walking around the room, power to you, excellent. You just gotta figure out what, what your threshold is and what your bar is for quality wise and what people connect with. If your thing is just like going and living your life and talking to your phone and you suddenly transition to having a full camera crew, it's gonna be pretty abrasive and that's not really why people wanna work with you, right? Or wanna watch you. So, I, I know what I want to put out on my channel and the level that people have come to expect, but I'm also not opposed to trying out new things. For example, today I just tried out YouTube shorts and um, after this live stream, I'm going to check and see how that's doing. But, and that would be typically something that I wouldn't say is the video that I put on the shorts isn't like at the bar that I want to put my content to get my content to. But if that's a very, powerful thing on YouTube doing these new types of videos and people really enjoy it, then it's time to adjust what I think of um, or what my, my threshold is for what I want to do while still maintaining that threshold for the other things. Collaborating with other artists or influencers is the next topic. And this is an important topic. I didn't do much collaborating till later on because I think one of the the things about collaborating is you want it to be organic. You want it to be like, you want it not to be forced. And I've seen a lot of times where people try to force it just for the sake of collaborating. You want, the best collaborations I've done have been with people who were very much my peers, 
very much my friends. When I first started YouTubing, I would have loved to collaborate with the guys that had uh, millions of subscribers, but why would they want to collaborate with me? That was like, that's like me as a hockey player um, going for a skate with one, of the, with one of the guys on the Jets. Like, it's just like, why, they, why do they want me there? They don't want me there. Unless maybe I'm doing like something that's very interesting to them, but it works a lot better when you are working with people who are on the same level as you. And this was one of the things when I was doing my song, a lot of songwriting down in Nashville, um, it was always said, you know what, you're not gonna just move down to Nashville and start writing with the biggest guys in the game. What you wanna do is you move down there and you develop your own crew of people and you will rise up together. And it's like a class at a high school. You will graduate and break into the world and get to that next echelon together as you rise above together. But it's extremely hard to jump in line and start collaborating with people who are way ahead of where you're at. So find the people who um, are kind of like in and around the same subscriber levels as you who would be open to doing that type of thing. Um, I know I get messages every day, probably on my Instagram, I don't really read them as much anymore, but people just like, hey, can we do a collaboration? Can we do a collaboration? But it's like, okay, well, what? this seems like a lot of giving here. If I'm collaborating with you, what is the benefit to me? It sounds like you're just trying to use my influence to launch your channel. What am I getting out of this? Um, everyone's gonna be thinking like that, so what would be the best way? The best way to do things organically is just find the people who are like in your year, in your class year, and then rise together. Um, like I know a lot of the people who I've been working with, who I've collaborated with, were very much started this at the same time I did. Like the Adam Neelys, the Ben Levins, um, Paul Davids, like these are people, Mary Spender, people I've worked with before, and we all kind of started doing it at the same time. And they knew who I was, I knew who they were. And because of that, when I popped into their DMs, they were more than happy to respond and likewise. And then it just like those things turn into to real, real friendships. So that's the biggest thing. Collaborate with people in a way, with collaborate with your, with your peers. Um, and also like do it because I, I have, I like doing it because I have an idea that works with people. I don't want to just, I'm not going to just reach out to someone and be like, Hey, let's do a video together and have no idea. Like I want to reach out to someone and say, here's my idea for a video. Do you want to be part of this? We're not just doing it for the sake of doing it. We're doing it because it actually works with the idea in the same way. If you're writing a song and you want to feature an artist on there, you want it to make sense with the song. You don't want to just push them in there for the sake of pushing them in there. Any questions on collaborating? Let's see what you guys are saying. Um, what if you can't make friends? Well, my friend, then uh, one of the best ways to make friends, I think, if I were to move to a new city, one of the first things I would do would be joining a rec sports team. I think that's just like one of the easiest most natural ways of meeting people. Um, so that would be my, that would be my theory. Join a rec sports team, join a rec sports team in a music city. And eventually you'll just start meeting musicians and musician types. My, my plan, if I ever move to, uh, to LA or Nashville is number one thing I'm doing is joining a rec hockey team. Cause I'm a pretty decent hockey player. Not amazing, but like I'm a decent rec hockey player. So like I can contribute to a team. And then if you're like, meshing over something non-music related, then it's more likely that those natural relationships will grow and turn into things that can help you with music. Uh, let's see what else you guys are saying. Um, Taylor Casperson asks, what part of my YouTube journey did I find most difficult? Probably just just keeping it going for as long as I have and just summoning up the, the strength and the creativity to come up with, to do 400 videos or whatever I've done so far. Um, there's been numerous times where I've like put out a video uh, and then the Monday comes around where it's time for me to think up my next idea and I just can't come up with, come up with anything. And I just naturally kind of like, well, I guess this is the end of it. There's no more ideas. Jenny, we gotta sell the house. We're moving, but I have always come up with something. Um, just finding, 
finding those ideas has always been the struggle, but I've managed to do it at this point. I remember this time last year, I was thinking how and how on earth am I going to be able to do 50 more videos, but I did it. And right now I kind of feel the same way. Like I don't know that I could come up with 50 more video ideas, but there's a good chance if you come back in a year, I will have done it. So just doing that, the persistence, that's been the hardest part. Uh, RB240 Tuner asks, have you ever thought about branching out to streaming? Yeah, I used to actually stream every Wednesday for a while. I, The reason why I stopped doing it was it kind of became, it stopped being fun. Uh, I just ended up answering all the same questions and ended up playing like all the same things. And the bigger ideas that I had for streaming, like having multiple people on, doing live switching, I just, it wasn't a practical thing to do at that point. So maybe someday I'll come back to it. I am like really enjoying doing this today because I haven't done this for a long time. But I know if I did this every week, it wouldn't take long for it to become not as fun. So that's why I stopped doing it. Jovante Music asks, how much do you think about thumbnails? Thumbnails, so when you click on a video and like if you're on YouTube right now, you could probably scroll down to the side and see all these videos that have a thumbnail that is the thing that you first see. It's like the book cover. And uh, it is, I think of thumbnails a lot. And I actually really enjoy the side of things, but that is the thing that's gonna hook people in. And if your thumbnail is great, then you just are making a better case to the YouTube algorithm. There's a better chance that things will start rolling with that. So it's a very, it's a very important thing. It's like, I think of it a lot. Um, and it always like, when I'm making the video, even before I shoot a video, I'm trying to think, okay, well, what's the thumbnail going to be so that I can essentially sometimes build out scenes based on that or build out ideas based on that thumbnail. Um, but it's like, it's like the title of a song. If you have the song title and you know the song title and you know it's a really strong song title, it's going to be a lot, you're, the chances are you're going to have more success with that song. In the same way, if I can just see that thumbnail before I, I even put out the video, there's, I just, that's one of the things that I usually can tell that that will be more, um, that video will be more likely to succeed. Whereas like there's times where I'm just battling with the thumbnail and I just can't find one that I like. And oftentimes those videos don't do quite as well. So thumbnails, extremely, extremely important. Get your thumbnails in order. Uh, okay. Here's actually a really great question. David German, German Balesteros. I'm very sorry for butchering your name, um, but he asks, how much free time do you think somebody should have available to begin a career in content creation? I think whatever free time you can find, uh, great, just start doing it, but to actually really think of it as a career and something that you can turn into a business, you gotta spend full-time hours doing this. At least that's what it was for me. I spent full-time hours, 40 hours a week, or more making videos that not a lot of people watched, earned next to no money, um, but I was in a very fortunate situation that my parents were okay with me just like being 27 and living in their basement and doing this thing that I, I told them, I was like, I really believe that this can turn into something. And they just had enough faith in me and um, I'm just very fortunate to have that situation where they let me live there and work on a job that makes no money. If I didn't have that, and if I wasn't able to put those two years into making, if I wasn't able to find two years worth of full-time hours to put into this, I wouldn't be where I am today. So when people ask me about luck, that is the one biggest piece of luck that I've ever had in my life, is having a support system that allowed me to get to where I am now. So that's why I think also, um, like it's more likely to see teenagers rising in social media because they, like, they have the time to be able to do something with those hours that most of us aren't able to anymore. I wouldn't be able to do that now because like I got responsibilities. Like I couldn't just start this career. If I wasn't doing this as a career, I couldn't start this career now because I've got a kid, got bills to pay. I don't know where I would find that time plus working a normal job. So instead of thinking of it as something that I would turn into a career, I would think of it, how can I just have a lot of fun with this? Treat it as a passion project. If things start to roll, awesome. But if they don't, I'm not gonna try to put all this pressure on this thing that I can't put the time into that would um, give me the best odds of success. So 
maybe that's not the uh, the most heartwarming and optimistic answer, but that is that's that's truth, man. It's what I've seen in my life. Okay, let's move on to the next point because this kind of ties in. How does being an online artist slash musician? How being an online artist slash musician is a viable path to take in 2021? So starting from scratch, like I said, it's very difficult. Here's something that you can do. And this is a, uh, this is something I would recommend that I didn't fully do from the beginning is if you have another project that you can use or another product that you can use your YouTube to market. So I have a friend of mine um, and he started his YouTube to sell his guitar course. That was the goal with it. His goal was not to be a YouTuber. His YouTube channel ended up doing quite well, but from day one, he was just trying to sell his guitar course. And so you have this other thing that you're working on and using your content as a uh, marketing tool for that is gonna make it so that it can pay off much faster because like if you're selling a guitar course or guitar lessons. So this is a thing I actually used to do. I used to um, teach lessons and I would just tell people, hey, if you wanna take a lesson with me, here's my email. We can set something up. I don't do this anymore, but something that I used to do. So if I only got a hundred views on a video, well, if one of those per people wanted to take a lesson from me, then um, I'm getting paid my, my rate there that I wouldn't have made before. So that, those hundred views have been monetarily worthwhile because I have this other thing that I um, am able to sell. I also did this with Fiverr and I mentioned I would come back to this. Fiverr is a website that allows you to sell online services. The idea is, is that you sell it for five bucks, but that's not, that's not the case. You can, you can set your prices for whatever you want them to be. And so what I would do is I used my, I started a Fiverr account when I was like living in my parents' basement to start generating a bit of money. And I would direct people from YouTube to Fiverr and Fiverr, if someone came across my page, I would use my YouTube as my resume. And doing that for a while, it started to gain some traction. And uh, I was actually making like pretty decent money on that for a while there before I shut it down just because the YouTube things started to roll a bit more. But like I was doing that for a while. I did so many gigs on, on Fiverr. So like things like that where you can branch out and use your presence online to do something else or to, to generate something else career-wise, business-wise, that is a great move. And I would suggest like anyone who is doing that be thinking of that because if your plan is to turn your YouTube views into AdSense and live solely off that, uh, that's very difficult. Like to the point where like, if I was only, the only thing I had that was generating my money was, was YouTube AdSense, I would be in a much different financial position. So things to think about. Oh, that kind of ties into our next point too. Using YouTube to promote your music or yourself as a musician or artist. So what I'm, what I'll talk about now is like, okay, so say you don't want to be like a YouTuber, but you want to use YouTube to get your stuff out there. So with that, what I would, uh, now you're not trying to think about like trying to get regular content out there. You're not thinking about getting the algorithm to turn in your favor because that's not, not what you're trying to do. You're not trying to become a YouTuber. In these situations, then I feel like you'd want to put, aim more for perfection more so than, aim more for quantity, sorry, for quality over quantity because you want it so that when you're like using your YouTube as a marketing tool or using it as a resume, that when anybody goes through it, they can just scroll and see that you are just a purely at a professional level musically. Um, like you, you're just, when people, you want, it, you want it to be so that when people eventually click on your channel or your content, they are not underwhelmed, that they, everything just looks like man, this is a guy that we need on our label. Look at what he's been doing on YouTube. This is just, I can see the work ethic. I can see the talent. You want that to be what you're aiming for. Whereas if they click on your YouTube and they watch like a really slick music video and then the next video is just like uh, a really rough video shot from your phone in low light of you playing a song and not maybe singing it very well, 
it doesn't look as good, in my opinion, to someone who's like, it doesn't look as good as a resume piece. So you might want to maybe think of like in those situations, having two things that you're hosting your, your stuff on. Maybe you use Instagram to do those, uh, those clips, or maybe it's a second channel called like, I don't know, band names, uh, whatever your band name is behind the scenes or something like that. So that when you direct people to one place, it just wows them. Everything's in order. Your thumbnails look great. And even if you don't have tons of views, I feel like if your thumbnail looks great, your, your, uh, you have lots of content out and everything that somebody can click will wow them. That is a very good place to be in. So that would be the biggest thing. Um, I also wouldn't recommend necessarily YouTube as the place if you're wanting to use a social media to grow your business. I don't know that YouTube is the best place. What you would need to be doing is like taking your YouTube and growing it in organic ways, whatever makes sense for you, whether that be sharing it amongst your friends, putting it on an email list, but YouTube in itself won't be the, uh, won't be the means to probably do that. So that gets into next point here. Wonderful, it's all tied together. Expanding into other social medias, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, etc. If you wanna use a platform to grow right now, based on what I've seen on TikTok in the last month since I've joined there, it seems to be the best place for organic growth for content. I think one of the theories that I've always had with social media is before you start posting, it's good just to spend some time on the platform, figure out some of the ins and outs of it, figure out what your community looks like there. What does the guitar community look like on TikTok? Well, I should probably get an idea of that before I start posting there so I don't, so I do things that can kind of at least not stand out um, in a bad way. If I'm on Instagram, kind of the same idea, what can I post here that, that organically fits with the platform? So spending time on those sites, just getting a feel for them so it feels like you belong goes a long way. And this also goes for like subreddits, understanding how r slash guitar works before posting there. <clears throat> if you wanna get some of your stuff rising on r slash guitar and you got some great guitar instructional videos, just get a feel for it so that you know like you're not stepping on toes and like, um, violating rules or stuff like that. You just know, get a feel for how it works on each of these social platforms or communities. One of my theories is, and I'm not, I don't always do this, is that if you can approach each platform as its own unique thing versus just like taking one piece of content and sharing it all over the place, if you can approach each one as something different, people will be more likely to engage with you in those different places. I, again, I don't always do this, but this is something that I try to do um, and it's not always the most reasonable thing to do. But like, if I'm posting the exact same video on all my social medias, well then why is someone gonna wanna follow me on Twitter or Instagram? If they can just, if they watch me on Instagram or on uh, YouTube, why would they follow me on the other, these other places? They're just watching the same thing. So instead I try to put unique content on each one of those places. So that if you're tuning in on Twitter, you're getting a very different experience and different side of things than you would get on Instagram, than you would on TikTok, than Facebook, than YouTube. Um, the idea would be like somebody would wanna follow you in all these places because it's just a unique experience and different and fun thing to do that there. So I think that's that would be the biggest thing. If you can't, it, that also requires like a huge effort. Creating unique content for five different places I don't know where you're supposed to find the time of the day to do this. So if you can kind of take certain ideas and like maybe take a YouTube video, edit it down and so that it makes sense on Instagram, then edit it so it makes sense on Facebook. At least you, it makes it feel like you're getting a unique experience there. So those would be my thoughts on that. Um, those are my talking points for today. So I figure for the rest of the time that we have together, let's just, Hit me up with questions. If you guys want me to talk on a certain subject, I am happy to discuss it. Uh, doesn't have to pertain to social media. If it does, that's great. But if it doesn't, that's cool too. Sean McDonald says, I'd love to hear you talk more about Winnipeg's music scene. Um, you mentioned that full-time music isn't viable there, but in my opinion, we also have a surprisingly cool local scene of places like Times Change. Certainly. Okay. so. When I say full-time music as a job, 
uh, I should clarify one thing. When I think of a full-time musician, I'm not thinking of someone who makes most of their money teaching. To me, that's a full-time teacher. So if you, and that's not to, to discredit teaching, like I've done a lot of it, but that's just how I think of it in my mind. Um, so if you want to also like teach music to make the bulk of your money and then just do gigging or whatever other jobs, power to you, excellent. That's not what I consider a full-time um, musician or guitar player. Though I'm sure, and you know, that's kind of a pointless debate, but let's just say you want to have a career in music and not teach. I don't think that's viable here unless you are one of the, like there's, I think three people who do YouTube here at the point where it could be a career. If you're not doing YouTube, the ways that you would make money in the industry are ways you would need to have, you need to have contacts. It's a, it's a people driven industry. It's a relationship driven industry. And it's just so much harder to develop that when you're not in a place where those types of things can just happen organically. When I first went down to Nashville, the very first time I went down to Nashville, um, I pulled into the place I was staying. It's the SoCan. It was the SoCan house, which is a, uh, a two unit apartment type of thing that you were able to stay at for free. If you remember SoCan, um, I pulled in, walked into my place, set up shop, went out to the communal, uh, table there and just sat down and the guy who was staying in this place beside me walked out and him and I just started talking. Turns out he was from Toronto as well. He was trying to move down to Nashville. And we just started talking about music and writing music and our goals. And him and I clicked quite, quite quickly. Um, I haven't talked to him for a while, but he's still, next time I go to Nashville, I'll for sure hit him up. But he has since gone on since that day, he has now had a very long prolific career writing mainstream country music down there for Canadian artists and for American artists. That is somebody, and that's the type of relationship that could have been very valuable for me had I wanted to work in that traditional realm. That happened on the very first day I went down to Nashville. And ever since I've gone down there, you just bump into people like that and you connect with people like that and you have friends who introduce you to friends who are musicians and working in the industry. And those types of relationships, those relationships lead to, to, to work and music. And if you're not just able to live in a place where those things happen organically, it's so much harder to make a living doing this. You're not gonna go into the Starbucks on, in Osborne and bump in to uh, a record executive who you met at, a, who you have a mutual friend with who you can just start up a conversation with. That's just not gonna happen here. That type of thing happens in cities where there are professional musicians. The things that I've been able to leverage out of my career doing um, music. Literally, I don't think anything in Winnipeg, um, but when I've been in LA, every time I go down there, like just cool things, like just cool things kind of happen. Um, I found myself at the, the, uh, the Playboy headquarters, I think like the first time I went down to LA. And that just happened as a matter of just like bumping into the right people. I went down to this event called VidCon and as part of VidCon, I was working with a, uh, a thing called an MCN, which is a multi-channel network, kind of a management agency for YouTube. Total waste of time for the most part. Don't get involved with an MCN. However, the one thing that was cool is we had a dinner. And then at that dinner, uh, the guys who worked at the MCN, they had a couple of their friends come to that dinner. And these are friends that they'd had for years. And so I, I was just sitting beside one of these guys and I was chatting with them. And he's like, oh yeah, I work at Playboy now. I won the content. Uh, content supervisors there. He's like, well, on Thursdays, we have this kind of, uh, everyone who's working in the office, all the girls, all the employees, just come hang out, have pizza, have beer. If you want, come by and, and hang out. And so I was like, uh, this is me having never like done anything of interest before in the music or entertainment world. So I was just like, yes, I will certainly be there. Before I went to that, um, he sent me a text message and he's like, Hey, so two of the, the playmates are, they're working, they're doing some video for their gaming channel. If you want to come by early, you can be on their channel. And so just, so I went by, we shot some videos with them. Um, I've since been friends with them for, for years now. And I've done a couple of videos, uh, with, with those guys. And it's just like, that just happened because of just an organic connection. It wasn't something that I forced. It wasn't something that I went out and found. 
But like those types of things just happen in music cities or entertainment cities. They don't happen anywhere else from my experience. So that would be my, my views on that. Um, and that's just my unique situation, but that I think expands to the broader idea of, of working in the music or entertainment industry. If you wanna catch tigers or you wanna chase tigers, go to places where there are tigers. If you're going to go chase a tiger up in the Yukon, your success chances are gonna be very low. If you're gonna go look for polar bears there, well, actually, I don't know if there are polar bears in the Yukon. If you get up to Northern Manitoba, you'll have a better chance of seeing a tiger. No, <laughs> a better chance of seeing a polar bear than a tiger. I hope that answers that question. That's, that's my experience with it. Other people may have had different experiences. I can only talk about what I've seen and what has worked for me. Okay, BC Guitar asks, thoughts on guitarists learning to play for the camera slash Instagram slash YouTube versus the past when people learn to play live on stage with other musicians? Um, I think both of them are extremely, extremely valuable. I haven't done a lot of practicing over the last 10 years, but I know that I've gotten better because of the way that I've recorded myself. Um, but I don't think I would have been able to do what I do had I not spent a lot of time playing with bands. I think that's a huge, huge, playing with bands and playing live, playing gigs. Like I've done a lot of that in my life. And that is a huge part in becoming a well-rounded musician. If you never ever want to do that side of things, I mean, whatever, power to you. If all you ever want to do is just shoot videos for Instagram, then yeah, okay, that's your goal. Love it. Keep up with it, you don't need to do that. But if you wanna be a truly well-rounded musician, you do need to spend time playing with other people. So it's a very important thing to do. I would re recommend it for everyone. Um, a lot of the development I've had in my life has been just with playing with people who are better than I am, be, them, be that teachers, people I've played in bands with. Just playing with people who are better than you just makes you, it's like a cheat code for, for music. Now, shooting videos for Instagram or, or YouTube or what, or what have you, um, there's other tools that has that forced me to become really good at. Um, I am much better at crafting a nice, well thought out solo that fits in 30 seconds now than I would have been 10 years ago because I've just done it so much. Like I've crafted out, figured out every note, how every note fits in there. Um, and having done that enough has just made me a better musician and so by doing those things, like trying to get that perfect take and recording yourself over and over and over again, you, you hone these little things in your musical, um, your musical mindset that will be very valuable and you can take to any, any elements of it. So honestly, what I recommend, do both of them. You're gonna get a unique experience shooting for Instagram. You're gonna get a unique experience playing with bands, do them both, you'll be a happy person and you'll thank me because you did it. Uh, let's see what else you guys are saying here. What, Stuart Drake asks, what was my favorite gig slash, uh, so session live or YouTube collab? My favorite live show that I've ever played, uh, there's one that comes to mind. So I talked about when I moved back to Winnipeg to launch, to start my career in music, I put together this band um, and we were gonna do YouTube videos. So with that band, we played a couple, a couple bars and a couple shows, but we put we put on one show where we rented out the Park Theater here, which seats, I can't remember, 300 people. And I just, so like I texted every single one of my friends that I thought might be interested. And I was like, listen, I'm, I'm back in Winnipeg. I'm putting on a show. Do you want to come? If you want to buy a ticket, I'll come deliver it to you. So I just like hand delivered like 200 tickets and sold them to all my friends. And we filled the room with like all these people that I care about. And we practiced a bunch for it. And it was just great atmosphere. It was one of my favorite shows that I've ever played. Um, I've played for bigger audiences, but this one was just the most enthusiastic group of people who wanted to see me succeed, who really enjoyed the music. And at that point, it felt like my career was starting to move forward. So that was that probably stands out as one of my favorite gigs. Besides that, for YouTube collabs, favorite YouTube collab. My favorite YouTube collabs are the ones where I'm in the room with the people. Like I've done a lot where you send files back and forth. And it's just not as fun as being in a room with someone. Um, some of my favorite, probably the ones that I like the most are like when I'm sitting beside or doing something with friends and we're, we have no script, we're just, we have an idea and it's just happening organically. 
The video that I've shot with my three buddies from Winnipeg who aren't musicians, the Shop Dogs videos stand out as favorites because it's just like, these are my these are my boys. We play hockey together. Like we're in numerous group chats together. I've known these guys for years. So doing a video together was just fun and it feels fun. And so like stuff like that, getting together in a room. Okay, uh, let's see what else you guys are saying. Um, Taylor Casperson asks, how did you gain traction on Fiverr? I think I got in on Fiverr when it was pretty new. So I haven't done Fiverr for maybe three or four years, four or five years now. So it might be a very flooded market where there's just tons and tons of guitarists. But when I joined, there were, I, I, I know that people would message me after I had sent them things and be like, and they would all were just, blown away by the quality that I was giving them. And I thought in my mind, like, it's just like, this is the base level. So I think that I was offering something that was better than a lot of people were. Cause I wasn't at that point, I wasn't an amateur. I was very much professional who was using professional gear. So uh, my point is like back then it, there wasn't a ton of people who were like me. Whereas now I think there's tons of people on Fiverr who are just doing it at a really high level. So I don't know exactly how to do it now but what i did is i just slowly waited i just put up my my ad i tried to make my ad look as professional as possible I tried to make sure that everybody who um bought something for me was satisfied to get those five star reviews and by the time i had stopped doing it like it took a while for for things to start to flow but by the time i'd stopped doing it it, it was a pretty pretty big business so not that big but a sustainable business at that point so that's what I would recommend. Just trying to do it to your best. Look to see what other people are doing. See if you can offer something unique. That would probably be helpful. Evan Sales says, Sammy, what's the harshest criticism you've ever received and how did it impact you? And what did you do? Great question. Criticism is very important. Not always the nicest thing to receive, but it's very important. I've had a lot of really good teachers in my life and going to school for music um, at a college that is quite respectable and hires pretty serious musicians. Like that's one of the benefits there is you get access to these musicians who you would never have access to in the real world. Um, and so in my third year, I did a songwriting class taught by the legendary Rick Emmett of Triumph fame. He wrote the song Laid on the Line as well as Magic Power somebody out there, there's a but the, huge success, the, the most successful person I had ever encountered. And the fact that he was my teacher was just like the coolest thing in the world. There's, here's this guy whose music I've been listening to for years. And now I'm just sitting in a classroom with him. Uh, and he, but the thing about Rick is that he is offers very cutting criticism that gets just to the, the root of your, of your issues. And in the songwriting class, what we do is we would play a song and then everyone would go around the room and everyone would offer their opinions. And then finally, Rick would say uh, what he thought of it. So we did this for a while. Um, I remember there was one girl who brought in a song and he told her, he's like, this is, I on, he's like, I don't really have anything to say about it. It's that good. And that's one of the things, to that point, he had never said that to anyone. And it was a really, really good song. Um, and so for me, I hadn't shared my song yet. And I was like, I really, I want that criticism. I wanted to hear my song and be like, you're ready to go into the world and go and crush it. You're that, you're that good. That's what I wanted him to tell me. Brought in my song, that is not what he told me. Um, I don't remember the specifics of it, but I thought my song was way better than in hindsight how it actually was. And he pointed out all these things that were issues with this song and kept it from being great. So for me, that was a little bit of a crushing blow to the ego because I just wanted to hear it. Hey man, great song, go on your way. I'll, I'll send this out to all my buddies at labels. And that, that's what I wanted, didn't happen. And so I started really, at first I was like, well, maybe he's wrong. Maybe he just doesn't get it. But after that uh, feeling faded, I was like, okay, so he does actually have a really good point about a lot of these things. I can be a much better songwriter. And so I started thinking about, okay, well, how do I go about becoming a better songwriter? I know how I became a better guitarist, but for me, songwriting was always just piece of paper, start writing. And it was over. And when the song was over and I would move on to the next thing. That was what songwriting was to me. But then I was like, I wanna become a good songwriter. How do I do this? And so I started researching, you know, songwriting resources. Uh, one of the best ones that I, I ever bought was 
the book by uh, Pat Patterson, Writing Better Lyrics, and I started like looking into that, and I started reading about songwriting exercises and how to actively become a better songwriter versus just trying to do it all from inspiration. And so I spent the next couple months doing that, and then I wrote another song, and I was like, you know what, I think this one is pretty good. It's definitely better than my last one. Um, maybe it's not perfect, but I think I'm onto something here. And when I wrote that song, I was like, I wouldn't have got to this point had someone just told me that my last song was amazing. I would have just kept on doing the same thing. And so I brought that song in, um, and I remember very clearly, I played that song, I had one of my friends sing it, and uh, Rick was like, wow, that is so much better than your last one. Like, if you can write songs at that level, you can be a professional in this industry. And so the harshest critique turned into probably the best critique that I've ever received. Uh, he did recommend a few little things to change, but it was like the first time where I, like I, I knew that that was good enough to be, if I could do that, and now it, was, it wasn't just me thinking that it was good, but I was having a trusted, vetted source tell me that it was as good as it needed to be. Um, and like that just, it was a very, very harsh critique to get in the first place, but then working hard and getting better made it very, very worthwhile. Um, and then from then on, like, the next year I ended up doing uh, a private lesson with Rick. So every every week I would now just like sit in a room with him, show him my songs and he'd critique them and we'd work on them to get them better. And I learned so much about songwriting in that year. Like that was, that was my training ground. From day one, starting those songwriting lessons to the end of the year, like that's when I grew as a songwriter. I don't do that as much in my career anymore, but I do think that I can do it on a very high level. And it's because of that, that intense period. So that's my thoughts on that. Uh, okay, Preston Smith says, how do you stop being your own worst critic? Okay, well, here's a great thing to do. And this is, relates to my last, uh, my last story there, is you find people you trust. And that's, when I say find people you trust who can critique you, I'm not talking about like your mom or your dad or your girlfriend who are gonna just say nice things about you. You find people who you know are at a level where th what they say is actually like valid. Um, don't get a songwriting critique from someone who writes horrible songs because it's like, well, what, what, what do you know? Find someone who you do respect and then get their, their critique of you. Because then if they're like, hey, this is really, really good. And you also wanna know that they're being honest. So you wanna find someone who's like a Rick type of guy. Um, but if they're saying, hey, this is really, really good, and in your mind you're like, wow, this really, really sucks, then you can take that voice and be like, oh wait, maybe my view is not totally accurate. It just gives you a bit more of a balanced um, view on what you do. And if you can do that multiple times and get the same feedback, then you know that you're onto something. One of the things I did with that song that I talked about earlier, the one that Rick really liked, um, was I ended up recording it the next year um, as part of my, my music degree. Um, but after I finished my music degree, I was just like, for a summer and a spring, I was just like trying to do every networking I could, networking event I could in Toronto. Um, and I was part of this thing called like the Songwriters Association of Canada. Is that what it was called? And there were tons of events in Toronto and I would go to every open mic I could go to. I went to every like critique session where like people would listen to your songs and give you their feedback. I went to Canadian Music Week, submitted my songs for feedback there. And with that one song, like I kept on getting very positive feedback. So I knew like, okay, this, is, this has been vetted by a number of people. Some people might not like this song, but I know that it is good. I know that it is a good song. Not everyone's choice, but I know it's good. And I believe in myself because I got that feedback from enough sources that to, to know that it wasn't all just in my head. So doing that kind of stuff is very, very valuable. If it's not offered in your city, like just Google up some lesser, like some songwriters that you, you like. Find some songs you like, see who wrote the song. If it's gonna be a massive band, uh, like if you're trying to figure out who wrote some huge country hit, they're probably not gonna respond if you say, hey, can I pay you for a critique? But if you find like some lesser known songs that you really like and you see, oh, this songwriter, I can find his website, I can send him an email saying, hey man, can I pay you a hundred bucks or whatever for a song critique? Very, very valuable. Again, you need to respect their time though. You need to at least offer like something like that, like to pay them. Because if you just email them out of the blue and say, hey, can you critique my song? It's one of those situations 
all give, no take. You got to do something to make it worthwhile for them and show them that you respect their time. Sometimes they might just say, I'll do it for free, but never expect that. Also, don't necessarily expect a response. If you send someone an email, they are under no obligation to respond to you. Um, there's nothing worse than seeing like, and I've had this happen to me. People send me an email and be like, uh, hey man, can we advertise this or this on your channel? I get, aver I get emails like that every single day. I can't respond to all of them. Um, but it really frustrates me when someone's like, oh wait, you're too good to talk to me now. And like they, they uh, send you an email saying like, oh, why didn't you respond? Like that kind of thing. Yeah, don't be that guy. It's not a good feeling. I would love to respond to everyone, but respect people, people's time. What else we got here? Uh, Jason Leon asks, how important are the connections made through a college slash university setting? To me, those are probably, those are hugely important. Um, when I think of like musicians who I'd want to hire right now, and this is something I feel limited by because I don't live where I went to school, all the musicians who I would hire to do things don't live here. So if I'm thinking, hey, I really would like to just get a drummer and a bass player in this video. All my mind instinctually goes to all these people who I knew from school. And had I uh, still lived in that place, like a lot of, or when I lived in Toronto, like a lot of the gigs that I was getting were coming from my school connections. Um, one of my buddies from school got me to sub on his country gig. And because him and I, because of that event, um, him and I started doing some sub work for each other. We became buddies. Had I stayed in this industry of trying to do traditional things like that, he would have been a very valuable connection because uh, one of the guys I got to know from through him now is the musical director for Sean Mendez. Um, my buddy is a guitar player for Thomas Rhett, who's like one of the biggest country artists in the world. Those are connections that come because I went to school and got to know those guys there. So all of my connections, had I not, had I not said I'm doing YouTube stuff now, any success I would have had in the music industry would have came from school. And if you remember back to my first story, the reason why I started doing YouTube was because of a guy that I met in school. Even, and just like seeing success is a very valuable thing too, because seeing success makes it seem not unattainable. Had I stayed in Winnipeg in the same circles that I was in, I don't know that I don't know anyone in those circles who's gone on to have like massively huge successful music careers. Uh, I'm sure there are some, but they're not coming to mind. I mean, yeah, like the Landreth guys, they've been they've had quite a lot of success. Um, but if I think of the people I went to school with. Like I know one of the guys I went to school with now is uh, a producer, like has done production work for Eminem, as well as like Daniel Caesar, as well as like a bunch of huge artists. I know another guy who has has songwriting credits on John Mayer albums. Um, my buddy Joel has been like in a world renowned band called Walk Off the Earth. Uh, one of my other buddies who I went to school with is in the Sheepdogs. There's a number of, like the list goes on. There's been a lot of successful people who I knew not, even if it wasn't directly from school, like knew indirectly from school. And had I wanted to stay in the traditional industry, those would have been very important relationships to, to keep going. So I think it, it is extremely valuable to be in school for music in a place where there is a, that kind of, that will bring together musicians of a very high level. Um, but also, yeah, like seeing success. What I was say, trying to say was, if you see success, it seems like it's not unattainable. It makes you feel like you can do it too. Having seen Walk Off the Earth have the success that I saw them have, not really seeing them as like these gods of rock who were onto something and were better musicians than I could ever dream of, but they were just like guys that I knew and seeing them succeed made me think like, wait, if those guys can do it, I can do it too. Um, seeing uh, my buddy, take a year off to go and produce a bunch of Eminem songs. It was like, wow, if he can do that, there's gotta be a way for me to do it too. It is a way just to, in seeing that kind of thing makes it feel like it's possible. If all you ever saw was people who went to school, didn't work out, quit it, 
and went and did something else, then you're just not going to believe that it's possible. So it's an important thing to see that kind of thing. Okay. What else we got here? Oh, we're running out of time. It's been pretty fun. I've enjoyed this. Have you got, have I, have, has this been entertaining? Have people enjoyed this? Give me a, give me a yes or a no <laughs> in the comments there while I scroll through. Uh, Steve Vachon, who's been quite active in this chat I've seen, asks, how easy is it for your music to get stolen via YouTube compared to live? Oh, I love this topic, stealing music. Okay, here's something that uh, I will say about this. It seems to me the only people who worry about getting their music stolen, the only time people talk about that are like people at, who are just getting started. No musicians who have got it, attained a certain level of success ever talk about this type of thing. But I remember like back when I was going to songwriting circles um, with just like open mics and stuff, people were always like, how do I keep my songs from getting stolen? Nobody's stealing your song. Just don't even worry about it. If you really want to, like you, you just don't need to worry about it. There's so much music out there. No one's going to steal your song. Even if it's really, 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 really good. No one's just going to straight up steal it. I've never even heard about, heard this ever happening. Um, if hypothetically it did, again, I've never heard this happen, and it, they did truly steal your song, then um, make sure you have recordings of it that are dated, I guess. Like, if you really want, you can copyright them, but it just seems like it seems completely unnecessary. Post it on, post something on an unlisted video on YouTube so that you can say, hey, look, I, I came up with this. And it's just like, it's not, it, it won't happen. I've never, ever heard of this happen, happening. Maybe like people who've been involved with bands and then uh, they quit, like the band broke up and then the band kept on playing the music that they started writing. Okay, I've heard of maybe that happening, but in that situation, like you need to have agreements with your band before. Like when you go into a partnership with a band, make sure that you've talked about a lot of these stuff, a lot of these things, at least some point along the way. Um, but as far as like someone just like writing a song, playing it in an open mic, and then some famous songwriter hears it and turns it into a hit, it's not gonna happen. <laughs> I hate to say it, your song's probably not good enough. Um, it's just like, it, it doesn't happen. As far as like taking your video and reposting it, like that happens, um, but there are systems in YouTube designed to make that not an issue. So that's that. Hello, Al John. That's my buddy, Al John. He uh, is a uh, huge Star Wars fan like myself and runs a Star Wars podcast that one day I would like to talk to him about more because I also am a huge Star Wars fan and usually we see each other at NAMM, but NAMM didn't happen this year. So next time, Al John, you and I will have a chat about Star Wars. Matthew Miranda says, do you reply to private messages on Instagram? No, I do not. I don't even go there. There's just too many. Um, and I feel like if you start replying to some, you kind of got to reply to all of them. Like, I think I probably get, I just can't. I don't have time to do it. I don't have time to emotionally invest myself in those situations. Um, because if I, you start talking to someone, I at least like to not, I like to like actually engage with them, not just give them like a cookie cutter answer. And I can't be doing that hundreds of times a day or else I would not do anything else and not have a life. So no, I don't. Um, the only time I do engage with people for, for sure is through my Patreon page. And my theory is there, if somebody is paying to support me, then the least I can do is give them a response if they have a question. I'm not always the most uh, on top of it, but I will eventually get around to responding to everyone there. Um, let's see what else you guys got. We got to wrap this up pretty soon because I've drank this whole thing of water and I'm kind of bursting at the seams. So we're gonna wrap this up pretty soon. Andy Collins, Mandalorian or the last season of Clone Wars? Loved them both. Very difficult to choose. Probably the Mandalorian. Ah, oh, no, but the last season of Clone Wars was so good too. Don't have a preference. Love them both. I'm currently reading the Thrawn book and I love that as well. You Stay Classy SD says, at what point would you outsource aspects of your social media? I've done it a little bit and then I've kind of 
unsourced it, outsourced it, then insourced it. When you can afford it or when you find yourself not able to do it, everything, um, for a while I had a manager who was dealing with all of my business interactions. And then uh, she said that she was just, she was hanging it up. And so then I did it a while for myself and then I just realized I don't have time to do it. So but I guess when you are too busy and your time is better spent other places. So for example, um, I have somebody who, uh, edit, who animates and edits all of my courses because she is way better at it than I would be. Um, and it's just not worth my time spending learning how to do that. Whereas like it's better just to pay someone to do that. And I spend my time doing things that only I can do, like making YouTube videos. It's not valuable for me to um, like respond to every brand email anymore because my time is better spent doing the things that only I can do. Someone else can do those, so I get someone else to do them. All right, guys, I think that is about it. I'm pretty hungry. Need to use the restroom, washroom. I can tell you a quick story about that. Uh, one time I was in like a small, I was in Nashville and I was driving to like a waterfall or something to check it out. And I stopped to pick up, to get gas in this tiny little town. And I walked into the, into the store and I was like, excuse me, where would I find your washroom? And the lady just thought it was the funniest thing in the world that I said the word washroom. She's like, here, down here, boy, it's a restroom. And then she like called over all of her coworkers. She's like, this, this boy here, you just call it a restroom. And I thought it was just so funny. And they were all pointing and laughing as I used their washroom. Anyways, we're going to wrap it up on that. Thank you guys for tuning in here. Uh, a big, big thank you to Long McQuaid and the L&M Learning Series for putting this on. I know that they got some very cool guys uh, lined up for the next bits in these, this series. So make sure you keep tuning in. Um, I love Long McQuaid too. And they are, this is not in the agreement that I say this, but... I worked there for years. It's where I do all my shopping in Winnipeg. Uh, as far as like gear goes, when I was in Toronto, it was the only place I went as well. I would take the extra subway stop, spend 45 minutes on a subway in order to go to Long McQuaid. So love the guys who work there. Cool place. Glad that they had me on this. So thank you guys. Stay safe. Keep wearing those masks. Um, hopefully next year we'll be able to do something like this in person. So. Until next time, thank you all for watching. I'm Sam Ray Guitarist, and I'll see you again soon. Oh, and I'm just seeing Long McQuaid saying they're doing a drum clinic with Larnell Lewis, who was a teacher at Humber, who is an amazing drummer. So check, check in on that too.